Welcome back to the Sports Medicine Orthopod. My name is Anthony Yu. Well, Drew, NFL Week 8 has come and gone, and a couple of really, really huge injuries. I brought you on, sports medicine specialist from Beacon Ortho, Dr. Drew Burleson, to talk about Jameis Winston and his ACL tear. We've done a lot of ACL shows on this show, but this is actually our first uh, YouTube ACL sh show. Uh, but to keep it a little different from the things we've done in the past, Drew, I'm just going to start off with some simple questions. And so I know you saw the injury. And so first question is, were you surprised after seeing that injury to learn that Winston had torn his ACL? Well, first of all, I'm a little bit surprised. I thought you brought me on to discuss all the Cleveland Browns injuries this past week. <laughs> <laughs> right now this but uh, <laughs> uh the biggest injury for the browns is to our ego right now um yeah. man, we're struggling anyway <laughs> but, man. no i mean a little bit i mean I, I would say i was a little bit surprised by the injury he sustained because i mean i was we've discussed this before the most common mechanism of injury for an acl is almost like a non-contact pivoting type of injury where the knee just kind of buckles on you and those are the ones you get really concerned about um, but then in, in also with the, Win, the Winston injury, whenever you get horse collared like that, I mean, any, anything could happen. Uh, it wasn't until you kind of saw those replays where his basically his toe was almost planted in the ground and then his knee twisted the way it usually does for these ACL injuries that you started to be concerned about. Again, like, is, was there an injury to the ligaments on the inside of the knee, the MCL, and then d did the ACL actually actually injure itself? So that was one of those injuries where I think whenever you see someone get horse collared, you don't necessarily see what happens with the legs as much, but the replay was made things a lot more concerning. Yeah, absolutely. And so in our world, the world of orthopedic surgery, sports medicine, uh, we call that buckling inward motion a valgus moment, uh, the opposite direction, kind of a uh, – what, what, what do we call the opposite mo motion, um, opposite of knock kneed, uh, bow legged, bow legged motion would be varus. So we're, this is a valgus moment where the uh, knee is kind of heading inwards. It is a classic mechanism um, uh, for an ACL tear. But yeah, you're right. A lot of times it's just, you know, somebody plants wrong pivots. There's nobody around and the knee will buckle inwards and that, and that ends up an ACL tear. This was uh, a little bit different being kind of provoked by uh, an awkward tackle. And so you kind of mentioned it briefly, but question two, are you surprised to learn that also his MCL was injured at the same time? No, I mean like that. Sometimes whenever you have these injuries, where like they call it the terrible triad, like one of those injuries is the injury to the MCL. So the, the MCL is the ligament on the inside part of the knee. So medial is the M, and then collateral ligament, um, the ligaments on the inside and the outside. So yeah, when we talked about how again, like if your knee like this and goes into a, a valgus type of shift that ligament on the outside part so over here if it goes like this that that's how it tends to just snap pulls off the femur bone so i mean it's very common again if you like look at the replays as well like his knee really kind of buckles and goes displays open like that on the inside part of the knee so again these injuries occur very commonly with acl injuries so again not surprising at all that he had that type of injury yeah and then you brought up the terrible triad something we learn as orthopedic pups so if we find out in a few days or so that it turns out he also had a meniscus tear, would you be surprised? No. Again, imagine like your, your knees like this, femur bone, thigh bone. Again, what, kind of the, the tibia bone kind of shifts around here, but also goes into that valgus type of motion. So you have this bone kind of pressing against that bone, and it can tear that meniscus on the outside part of the knee. Yeah. So again, meniscus is a C-shaped soft tissue disc that lives between the femur, the thigh bone and the tibia, the shin bone. And so, you know, if there's enough energy to tear a ligament, certainly there's enough there to injure a meniscus, which we see commonly all the time. Uh, we know he has an ACL tear. That's kind of the main event here. W why is it so important? So, I mean, especially it's important for people who do any type of cutting or pivoting type of exercises. So, if you're a sedentary person and you basically just walk and get up and don't do a whole lot of activities or even just run in a straight line, you don't necessarily need an ACL. But if you're doing any type of like cutting and pivoting type of exercises, then you definitely need an ACL. So again, if you're a professional athlete or especially a starting quarterback in the NFL, but you need an ACL to be able to, to play. Yeah, it provides rotational stability that no other structure in the knee does. And that's why, again, it is so important for these cutting and pivoting uh, sports. And so that brings me to my next question. And again, you kind of mentioned it. Does everybody who has an ACL tear, do they need surgery? No, not at all. I mean, again, it's, it's very much dependent upon what your activity level is. Um, and, and 
how much instability you can tolerate. There are some people who even say, you know what, I, I don't do, I do some ex- activities like skiing infrequently. So they may opt to wear a brace during that. But I mean, um, yeah, but if you're again, just going in a straight line, running a straight line, you don't necessarily need that, um, that ACL. I mean, I think the, the thought by some people is, well, I need to get this ACL fixed so that I don't get arthritis in the future. I mean, again, the studies have shown that they're that fixing your ACL or not fixing it. There's the rate of arth- arthritis is exactly the same. Um, so again, like if you're a person who doesn't really lead that active of a, of a lifestyle and can tolerate wearing a brace whenever you do do those types of things, absolutely. I think it's, a, those people can be treated without surgery. Yeah. And you mentioned some people will feel stable just with normal kind of everyday activity, walking, um, and you know, a lot of people that that's the extent of the activity they do. And so, uh, it, you know, and it probably seems like common sense, but why would somebody want to avoid surgery? Well, it's surgery and it comes with, as we know, uh, for all of our NFL and any sp- fans of professional sports or athletes themselves, it comes with a very, very long recovery, which we're going to talk about here. And we know that Winston's going to be out for the season. Uh, so that gives you an idea that this is going to be a lengthy road that he he's traveling down. Um, so let's talk about the timing. We haven't heard when he's going to go to surgery. And so would you be surprised if it doesn't happen right away? Like if he's not getting surgery this week, maybe it turns out it's going to be sometime in the next few weeks. Would that be surprising to you? Not at all. I mean, especially with that, they said yell injury. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple things. So sometimes that it, depending on how much that MCL is torn, um, you may elect to wait because the MCL will heal. A lot of the times there's a very good blood supply to the MCL. So if you treat that without surgery, uh, wait about six weeks, usually that MCL will heal. Um, also, again, he tore his ACL, he tore his MCL, we, meniscus, we don't know. Um, there's a chance that he has a ton of swelling in his knee right now too. So you really want to wait for that swelling to go down before you do any type of surgery because if you go in there too early and there's a lot of swelling, you run the risk of having some stiffness after surgery. So <clears throat> again, all of those things, I mean, it could be, you know, month, month and a half before he actually has surgery on this knee. Yeah, absolutely right. And that's what's so interesting about these ligaments about the knee. We kind of break it up as like a like a box. You've got uh, MCL on the inside of the knee, LCL and some other supporting structures on the outside, and then these two important ligaments, the ACL and PCL, uh, on the inside of the knee, and they cross cross each other. Uh, ACL just has no ability to heal itself. It's not possible. The meniscus is the same thing. It's a blood supply issue, but the MCL has a robust blood supply. And so it readily heals itself. And we are hardly ever fixing MCL, uh, tears though. We see them so commonly, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's not uncommon at all to have at least some partial MCL tear with almost every single ACL injury I see. And again, the amount of MCLs that I actually fix, um, it's very, very rare. I mean, it happens, but I mean, it's just exceedingly rare. And there's usually certain circumstances that will cause you to fix it. Yeah. And you brought up a separate point about what happens after you tear the ACL. Well, most commonly the knee blows up. Uh, it's going to look like a grapefruit full of swelling. It's inflamed. It's painful. And we've learned the hard way because we used to take athletes like Jameis Winston immediately to surgery because we're thinking we just got to get this fixed get them on the road with recovery. We actually did a show with uh, Jim Merlo who played for the Falcons in the seventies. And this is what happened to him. But we've learned the hard way that when you do that, you bring a knee that's acutely inflamed into the operating room to do an ACL surgery. You come out exactly that way, super inflamed. And it makes the rehab uh, very, very hard uh, for the patient. Um, We're we're not doing them any favors by by rushing them in. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, because, you know, conventional wisdom would be like, well, okay, well, the sooner you do the surgery, the sooner you're going to get better. The sooner you're exactly. going to get back. But right. it's, it's not right. Like, I mean, you, again, the swelling is just so intense after surgery that it's really hard to get that motion back. And it actually could prolong the recovery because you're just re- really trying to get that motion back. You're, and you're sacrificing a lot of the rehab in regards to strengthening um, to get that motion back. Yeah, it's kind of a second insult while the knee is still just trying to recover from that first insult and uh, calm the inflammation down and we're much better off uh, waiting than, than rushing in. Okay, so um, we hear all the time, I, I went and got my ACL fixed. Uh, he's getting the ACL repaired. You're an orthopedic surgeon. You do sports medicine surgery. You fix an ACLs every week. Tell us why that's a bit of a misnomer. How do you actually, quote, unquote, fix an ACL? Yeah, I mean, even I say fix. I mean, yeah. I, I feel <laughs> You're part of the problem, Drew. 
<laughs> well, I, uh, but yeah, I mean, there really is a difference between fix, uh, fixing and reconstructing. And what we typically do with a, um, ACL is we re reconstruct it. So the difference between the two of those is fixing means you take the native tissue and then you actually fix it back down. Like you put some anchors and suture it back down. That's fixing. So again, like a, a structure like the MCL, when that tears, a lot of the times we can fix it because the blood supply is so good. The ligament, the quality of the, the ligament is very good. So you can usually just put a suture anchor in there and then suture the native ligament back down. It, that's a fix. In those, um, rare, in those rare cases where you actually sure. have to do MCL right. surgery. Yeah. But the ACL we talked about, like the ACL, the blood supply is, is not good to that at all. So when you tear your ACL, the quality of that tissue is very poor. When you get in there, it's usually just falling apart. It's like mop ends. And there's no way you can suture that back together. And it, it, there's no way it would heal. Um, there are, for a different co topic of conversation, I mean, there are some people who are doing some ACL repairs now for certain types of tears. Um, but I mean, we'll, we'll just not talk about that right now. Um, yeah. They, the, the industry, industry standard, uh, or, or I'd say, I guess, standard of care would be what you're about to talk about ACL reconstruction. Yeah. Which meaning that you take tissue from another source. So your own tissue, which is autograft or cadaver tissue, which is allograft. And you actually reconstruct the new ACL. You, you drill some holes in the bone and then you put this graft in between there and fix it some different way. But yeah, we always, we also talk about fixing, but what we, what we really mean is having to reconstruct it. So I'm sure when they say Jameis Winston is having his ACL fixed, they actually mean it's being reconstructed. Yeah. You mentioned a, a <clears throat> graft. So again, you put it well, it's tissue that exists somewhere else that you're repurposing to become the new ACL. And so this we could talk literally for 24 hours straight about this because graft choice in the ACL is remains a topic of controversy. Um, but for Jameis Winston, the graft choice is, is probably pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. I mean, again, like you, we break, you break it down into two broad categories. Is this his own tissue autograft or is it cadaver tissue, which is allograft? Um, allograft is appropriate for some people. Um, but again, that's when you, Actually, when you start to get a little bit older, probably 30s, 40s years old, but he's going to get autographed. So that's the first thing. It's going to be his own tissue. The other thing is where it's going to come from. Um, there's, I'd say, probably three broad categories. There's patellar tendon, there's mm -hmm. quadriceps tendon, and there's hamstrings. Um, I feel like most people use, uh, especially in the NFL, will use the bone, patellar tendon bone to fix this. And that, If I had a guess, that's probably where he's going to get done. Yeah, I think we'd agree we consider the – bone, patellar tendon, bone, graft, autograft, the, the gold standard. Um, it, it's just got the best track record in terms of durability, uh, particularly for an athlete as high level as Jameis Winston or, you know, really anyone around 20 or younger who, who's a high-end athlete. And so we'd imagine that this is the graft choice that Clay Thompson got, that Jamal Murray got, that Nick Bosa got. Um, it, we would consider it to be the gold standard. Uh, quad, I think is an interesting alternative, but it's, it's probably a little bit newer. I don't think we have a, enough long-term data to say that it uh, w would be the right choice in this case. And so, right. yeah, I, I agree. Patella tendon, uh, w will be the graft. And then, um, you know, how do you get into the knee? Can you do this all arthroscopically? Absolutely. I mean, it's actually easier to do arthroscopically than it would be to do it with a big open incision because we have these tools, you know, the, this little camera that actually the camera has a little, the, the way it views it, it's at a 30 degree angle. You can actually see around corners a little bit. You can see into like little nooks and crannies with this camera. So it, it actually makes it very, uh, it makes it easier. Cause we're talking about where we want to put this graph, like on certain parts of the bone, we're talking about millimeters of difference. So I mean, again, mm -hmm. like a millimeter is about the width of a, the tip of a pencil. So for us, like a, a millimeter one way or the other is very important. So we want to be very precise with where we, where we put these. So again, we, a couple little poke holes around the knee. Uh, to get the instruments in there, um, maybe a little bit bigger one just to actually get the graft uh, into the knee itself. But yeah, I mean, we we do this typically all arthroscopically, and then um, bring the graft into the joint. And there's various ways you can fix it, from screws to something called suspensory fixation, where there's sutures that um, get fixed via via buttons to the the edges of the bone. But I mean, yeah, there, there's usually drilling some type of tunnel into the femur bone and into the shin bone, and then fixing it some way. Yeah, all the kind of work in the joint itself and, you know, arthroscopic, if we break down arthro means joint, scope is camera. Uh, I think a, maybe not a lot of people are familiar with that term, but the concept of this minimally invasive surgery that you and I do all the time um, is, is pretty commonplace type thing now. So all that actual work inside the joint, 
cleaning out the old ACL, preparing the the tunnels, as you said, to accept the new ACL, um, uh, fixing it, holding it in place, whether it's with screws or the suspensory devices, like you mentioned. We, we can do all that uh, somewhat like a video game. We're watching a camera, a, a big monitor. We have one camera in one hand. We have an instrument in the other hand. We have an assistant kind of helping to position the knee appropriately. This all sounds super complex. How long does the surgery take? 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the graft harvest will add an additional, um, you know, 10 minutes or so uh, to, to the surgery. And that's kind of the open portion of, of the surgery where you actually have to um, make a longer incision to harvest the graft. We, we can't really harvest the graft, uh, you know, arthroscopically purely. We, we, we do need to um, make a bit of a longer incision to do that. Um, uh, in these cases of cadaver ACLs, the, the incisions end up being very small um, because you're not actually harvesting any tissue. But to get the bone uh, patellar tendon graft out uh, will require, you know, maybe, I don't know, three, four centimeter incision, and then the rest of it's arthroscopic, right? Yeah, I mean, I usually make a five millimeter incision. Five, sorry, five. <laughs> um, I, but so, yeah, I mean, I think that's about the standard. Yeah. And so, you know, all this sounds super complex, but like you said, you know, it's something you can do in about an hour's time, outpatient surgery, and it's a very safe surgery as well in terms of complications, right, Drew? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, again, the complications you think about, are, I mean, like one re-rupture, um, sometimes people have some pain in the front part of the knee, we call it anterior knee pain, um, but a stiff knee, I mean, but for the most part, like major, major complications are very, very rare infections or blood clots and things like that. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's usually a, a relatively successful surgery. Yeah. I mean, knock on wood, I can't think of an infection in my hands. Um, or no, nobody's ever died on my operating room table who was getting an ACL done. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, a pretty safe, uh, surgery. Um, it's the back end stuff that we really get concerned about because the rehab is so long. Why, why is the recovery so long? I mean, it, it's broken down into a, a lot of different phases. I mean, you know, so again, the earliest you probably get back is about nine months. You know, that's that's the, the earliest. It just takes a long time. Like we talked about early on, you have to get that range of motion back. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest thing. And then you have to really get your muscles to start firing again. So it's, it's hard for people to actually get their muscles to work. Like, I mean, you can, you're that... It seems like there's a break in the disconnection between your brain and your and your muscle. Like you you want it to fire, you just can't get it to fire. So you have to almost have to relearn how to get that those muscles to fire. The muscles at the like, even in professional athletes, those muscles atrophy. It's crazy how you see the people back at like two weeks after surgery, and their thigh muscle is just so much significantly smaller than the other one over the course of just a couple of weeks. So you have to build up back that strength, and and eventually you get back to the point where you can start doing sports specific type of stuff again. But then you have to get your conditioning back. So you know, just a lot of different phases to the recovery that makes it take a long time. And why is it so different from person to person? You know, you and I have referenced many times previously uh, the Adrian Peterson excellent ACL recovery poster child for ACL recovery, whereas Derek Rose and you know a lot of folks might not remember, but Derek Rose was like the bee's knees MVP level player. And ACL kind of really derailed that. And it took him a year and a half really to get back on the court. And he was never quite the same. Like, wh why is it so different from person to person? Because, well, I guess part of it, I don't know exactly what they're doing with the meniscus. Okay. So, I mean, are you having to do something with the meniscus? Or are there other ligaments that were injured? Um, again, like how quickly can you get those muscles firing again? Yeah. How much, how quickly can you, can you get your motion back? I mean, there's also this, um, I guess, something called proprioception as well. It's like, you know, being able to, sense where your body is without actually having to think about it. So, again, sometimes people will have more proprioceptive injuries where they can't just necessarily, they, they, they don't, it doesn't feel quite the same and they, it takes a while to get that back as well. So, I mean, there's a, a lot of variables that go into this. Uh, it's, again, not everybody recovers the same way either and their strength, is, their baseline isn't the same. So it's just a, a, when you're thinking about something over a very long period of time like that, um, it, there's the variability is, is big. Yeah, it's a very individual experience. I tell all my patients that, you know, you don't want to measure yourself against somebody else. You go at your own pace. You're ready when you're ready. And there's also a psychological component to it. Not that I'm suggesting at all that Derek Rose had any psychological uh, uh, obstacles in his way. But I think if you ask anybody who went through an ACL recovery, 
you're, they're going to tell you that it, it was challenging mentally. Uh, we had Jonathan Clark, professional slam dunk um, uh, athlete on, and he, for financial reasons, had to get back to playing with the Globetrotters at six months after an ACL. And he said he was not ready mentally at all. Um, like he could dunk, but when it came to doing side to side, like their, their classic, like weave formations, he was very nervous. Um, and so, you know, everybody's different and we'll see what happens with, uh, Jameis Winston. I don't think it's a question of whether he gets back on the field, but certainly when, and next question, what do you think prognosis? Like, is he going to be, you know, he was playing great, right? This is like yep. the win of the year. He's he's a young guy. I don't, it's hard to say like he's resurrected his career, but he was playing great. We'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, what, what kind of player do you expect to see back? You know, I mean, based on the way he plays, like I don't see it changing his game too much. You know I mean? I, I think that he comes back next year sometime. Um, again, is he bit ready for the beginning of the year? I don't know yet. I mean, it's, 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 it's that that's iffy. Um, I think he'll be back hey. sometime. Um, and I get in, it's, and again, it's hard to say he's going to come back at the same level he is this year just because, again, you haven't played football for a year. So, I mean, there's obviously going to be some acclimation period, but I anticipate him next year. And the year after that, I feel like he'll be back to the way he was the start of this year. Yeah, year two in the recovery for a lot of these lower extremity injuries, ACL included, seems to be when folks start to um, approach their baseline. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Like we said, it's very individual and you cannot predict it. And so he just needs time to first get a surgery done and then rehab appropriately. And then, and then we'll see from there. Mm -hmm. um, Drew, that was good. Any parting thoughts, any, any parting ACL thoughts or Brown's insight? Um, <sighs> insights. I wish I had some insights on the Browns, right? Now. I, I don't know. We're, we're going through a tough period. I, it's funny. I feel like just a few weeks ago, I was like talking to my buddies, just like, you know what? I think we're a Super Bowl contender. And now <laughs> I'm like, win the game again? <laughs> you, you, you never know what's going to happen. But that might go down as a freezing cold take. <laughs> <laughs> what's now, now you're you're uh beacon orthos in cincinnati or, or thereabouts so yeah. what what's the mood after uh the Bengals lost to the jets by the way i had the Bengals in my survivor pool and i was feeling very good about myself and I, i'm done <laughs> I, I, the mood is still pretty optimistic about the Bengals right now you know i mean it's just like it was a very big win the week before and yeah. now it's it's very easy to have a letdown the week after um yeah. so i mean I'm sure after just be um beating Baltimore the way they did. And then just thinking yeah. oh, I think the Jets, it's, it's human nature. I can understand that. So I, and I think a lot of people, that's the, the feelings around here. I think that people are very happy and excited about Joe Burrow. So I mean, I still, I think the mood is still very high right now. That's good. Cincinnati is a friendly place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Drew, uh, really good to see you. Uh, we'll see what uh, happens in week nine. Fingers crossed. No, nothing major. Um, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please hit subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in. If you like the show, please subscribe, like, and share. And we'd love to hear from you. If you have a question about today's show or you, a loved one, or maybe your favorite athlete has sustained a sports medicine injury that you would like to know more about, please reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or email. And stay tuned for more exciting content from the Sports Medicine Orthopod. Thanks again.